Anyway, um, I was uh, starting to write up questions on the two papers that we were going to do today, and I realized that um, my my model of only reading papers and not talking about sort of the broad background and general areas might not be perfect. Um, and I thought it would be good to take a step back for today and delay uh, what we were going to do for today until I sent around an email, I think, about this. I've been sick, so I'm not sure if I actually sent around an email. Um, and just take a step back and, and talk about um, some of the big picture issues and different metrics for measuring diversity um, and sort of the general workflow by which people take sequence data and convert it into OTUs or other information and how that's generally done before we actually get into the papers that analyze that data and try and, you know, make some sense out of it. And I think, um, I hope that this will be useful to take this um, step back. Um, and uh, what I wanted to talk about first was this um, issue which has, the landscape keeps changing as, as sequencing gets cheaper and cheaper. You need more and more computational capacity to analyze the data that you get out of certain projects. And one result of this has been that people spend a lot of what they do in analyzing data is pushing buttons that are running other people's programs. That, um, and you hope that it's going to do what you want it to do. And people are now being driven by the available software as opposed to the ideas that you would like to do. And so I think it's useful um, for everybody who does work in this area to try and make sure you ask before you push those buttons what you want to do with the data and, and what questions you want to ask and really what are your goals. And unfortunately, many of these are not always compatible with the available tools. And either you have to you know, have someone who knows how to do serious computational programming or you beg the people who write the tools to add a feature um, into their <laughs> software. Um, or you know, you, uh, what a lot of people do is they might generate 100 million sequences for a study and then analyze 1,000 in certain ways, because they may only be able to, in their computational capacity, analyze a subset of the data. Um, but anyway, I think that it's important to take this sort of step back. And um, we haven't really talked about it this in detail, but one of the things that many people want to do with ribosomal RNA data or metagenomic data is ask, who is out there? What organisms are out there in a community? And the main way that people have done this is to try and do what's called taxonomic assignment for the sequences. So you take your data, you take your sample, you can, however you want to do this, you could do it without sequencing, but in general, if you go out and you want to characterize the biological diversity of an environment, you want to know what taxa are there in that environment. And with sequence data, the way you do that is um, there are a couple of options, and we'll talk about them. Um, I, of course, as you probably know, um, think that the best way to do this is by building an evolutionary tree of the sequences. So um, this would be sort of the equivalent, and this is not that commonly done. If you went to an island and you found a bunch of new plants, most of what people would do to what's called sort of key out those new plant samples would be to get out a guide, some type of key or information about plant diversity and try and starting to walk your way through a taxonomic list of plants or some other means of identifying them until you can get your sample into some nook where it matches previously characterized organisms. So it might have the right leaf structure or the right, you know, venation pattern or the right color patterns um, to get into, you know, some family or genus or species at that level. And um, 
But there's an alternative approach that you could do with the leaves, which would be to gather data on leaf morphology and build an evolutionary tree based on those patterns and put your new leaf into that evolutionary tree. And many you know, field ecologists, field biologists will do this eventually with their data, but the first pass might be this sort of just lookup table approach. And the second pass might be an evolutionary tree approach. And that's the same thing that people do with ribosome RNA data. So you go you know, to your environment, you get DNA, you do PCR, and you get out of that sequences. And usually um, <coughs> what people frequently do is they'll take one sequence at a time and then compare it to a database of previously characterized sequences that hopefully have taxonomic information associated with them. And they try and figure out where their sequence sits relative to the previously characterized ones. And there are really two main approaches to doing this. One is to look just at what thing in the database is my sequence most similar to. You can do this in a variety of ways, but let's just say you, um, uh, you could split it up into the Carl Woese style oligonucleotides and make a table of all the different oligonucleotides in different sequences and ask how many does mine share with all the other sequences and then say yours is most closely related to the one that it's most similar to. And that is what people originally did when they were generating. That's why when we went through the Pace paper, they were showing you know, the table of shared oligonucleotides with the previously calculated oligonucleotides. And um, that was one approach to figuring out what your sequence was. And another approach is to build an evolutionary tree. Take your sequence. You have usually a pre-computed alignment of your reference data. This is what people are downloading from various reference databases or occasionally making it themselves. Hopefully you have um, taxonomic information about each of these. And um, you might even have a pre-computed phylogenetic tree. Are you allowed to talk more about how to characterize the new sequence? Yeah. So, so for characterizing a new sequence, it's important to realize that you're not analyzing it on its own. What people usually do is they go to that database mentioned in one paper, ARB, where they go to a new database called Green Genes, or a database called RDP, the Ribosomal Database Project, or a few other databases. Those have built alignments of ribosome RNA sequences. They have linked those alignments to taxonomic information about those sequences or environmental information if they came from environmental samples. And they might have already computed a tree for those sequences. And so now your job, if you want to figure out what this new sequence is, is either to do a, that similarity type search to everything in this database or build an evolutionary tree, and now place your sequence into the evolutionary tree with all the other sequences. And, and if you do that, let's just say your sequence goes here. The next step you have to do is to look at the taxonomy of all the other sequences in the tree and ask, what do they share in common? So it may be that this is E. coli, and this is Salmonella typhimurium, another close relative of E. coli. And it's not grouping inside the E. coli group. It's grouping in between these two, the E. coli and Salmonella enterobacteriaceae family, maybe, and some other group. Maybe this is the alpha proteobacteria, and these are gamma proteobacteria. So you try and basically guess a taxonomic level for your sequence based upon where it sits. And you could say, if these are all proteobacteria, you're confident that your sequence is a proteobacteria. And if these are all, you know, let's change it and say these are all gamma proteobacteria. So you can say yours is a proteobacteria, a gamma, and then you try and assign it at finer and finer scale resolution. 
to the taxonomy. And um, this is a really commonly used and important approach to looking at any type of new environmental data from any type of organism. And for microbes, this is basically, it's all a bioinformatics workflow, basically, for analyzing the data. And then you go back and you do the same exercise now for sequence two. And what most people do is they don't add sequence one into their reference database. They analyze sequence two compared to the pre-existing references. And then they analyze sequence three compared to the pre-existing references, and sequence four, and so on. And there are you know, advantages and disadvantages to doing this, but one limitation is if your sequences are closely related to each other, you may not be able to tell that by separately analyzing all the individual sequences. And so in, as we get further along into the course, the more sort of modern workflows that many people use will try to analyze all of your sequences at the same time. That can be hard if you have 100 million of them. No computer program will allow you, I mean, nothing that exists will allow you to do them all at once. Um, so is that basically, so this is one of the sort of hallmark activities. All of the figures that you see in a lot of human microbiome papers and soil microbiome papers, a lot of them are based upon this part of the workflow. You're just building a tree and you're assigning putative taxonomy to your sequences and then you do that for all of your sequences and now you produce a pie chart or a bar chart summarizing all of the patterns across all of your you know, samples for that particular sample. Um, so uh, Another common thing, which is what we were getting to in these papers, um, is to go beyond this just taxonomic assignment and try and assign different types of diversity measures to your sequence data, to your communities that you're sampling. And you can sort of generally call this ecological characterization of the community, although um, there's a bit of overlap between a lot of what people do. Um, yeah. I was just wondering, how does one decide which sequences to use as reference? Uh, well, um, so uh, most people don't decide. They just download the reference database. So it's mm -hmm. up to the people who built the reference database to decide for you. Um, so for each of those databases, there's a single reference database that's collecting that data? Not exactly. Um, most of them split it up by bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes with the new... Williams and Embley paper, they may worry about whether or not that's a smart strategy if, if there are not three domains of life. Um, but um, so we wrote, we've written software in my lab that tries to do tax, high throughput taxonomic assignment of sequences. And one thing we did um, was when, when I believed that there were three domains, um, I'm really not sure anymore. Um, what we did is we went to the databases that existed and we looked at all of them. And it turns out um, the databases that are really good for bacteria and archaea suck for eukaryotes. And the databases that are good for eukaryotes are really bad for bacteria and archaea. So we collected data for bacteria and archaea from one database. And we went to a separate database and got the data for eukaryotes. And we wrote a program that would go through in the first step for the sequences and take each sequence one by one and assign it to one of the groups. So for all of the sequences from the environment, you're saying? Yeah, for new sequences from the environment. And what we did was we merged these together. We built a big alignment that had some representatives of eukaryotes, some representatives of bacteria, and some representatives of archaea. We made that ourselves. We chose, you know, by, by the taxonomy, basically. One representative of each phylum. <laughs> something that effect. And we did a first pass evolutionary tree that assigned it to one of these branches, hopefully. And then once it was assigned to a branch, we used the database that we downloaded from this database collection for the archaea or for the bacteria. And so we didn't, you know, in the end, well-sampled groups 
you know, the databases are pretty good. Poorly sampled groups, you start to say, oh my god, I didn't, that database does not have enough representatives of my group, and this paper came out last week that has 17 more, and I want to add them, and then you try and figure out how to add them to your database. <laughs> and I mean, one of the nice things about this ARB database is people have sort of collaborated on adding things back into the database. So there's been sort of a community effort, and you can share your alignment within the ARB reference system to other people. The RDP did not make that easy for people to do. So um, this has gotten much worse with the new, <coughs> I mean, with the new sequence data. It's just permanent panic attack about how to deal with you know, the reference information. So this Green Genes database came along most recently. Um, and what they tried to do was um, curate the database, but not try and cover everything. So they would try and fill up the database with full length sequences that represented major lineages and not try and get overwhelmed with, for example, 200 million E. coli sequences, which there probably are right now. Um, and that just, there's no point in most studies to have the diversity of all the different E. coli and salmonellas in your collection. So, um, but it's a continuing struggle. I mean, so now a lot of people analyze their data inside a database, a, a program called Chime. Um, Chime is this amazing workflow for analyzing sequence data, but there's a continuous debate about whether or not the, yeah, well, not easy to use necessarily, but it is an amazing workflow. There's a continuous debate about how they're, what database to use for that and how it affects your results. Um, is that answer your question here? Okay. So um, the, many of these things that we're going to talk about, you can do, do them in various orders. So there's another um, sort of step in many workflows that relates originally to questions about ecological diversity. So if you wanted to count the number of sequences in a particular group within your data set. Um, there are many ways to do this, but the main way that people do this is they take their sequences. So you could count by saying, how many times do I get sequences that show up on this branch? But that can be somewhat of a pain, and if you had 100 million sequences, you might not want to build evolutionary trees for 100 million sequences. So what people do a lot of is they take all the sequences that they get, and actually before even aligning them in a big alignment to each other, they do a really quick comparison of each sequence to each other sequence. You basically use a computer program that slides the sequences against each other, and as it pulls one sequence against the other, each time you pull one base, basically you give it a score for how many overlapping bases you have. So if the AC line up, a, 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 you give it a high score, and if they don't line up well, you give it a lower score. And there are many different programs that people use to do this sort of comparison, but basically you're trying to find the maximal score that you can get by lining up two sequences with each other. And this can be done really fast, um, uh, and you, you do this for all of the sequences in your data set, and you get this giant matrix. So I showed you some distance matrices before. Now if you have 100 million sequences, you get a matrix that is 100 million boxes by, you know, 99,999,999 ,999 wide, filled with the distances between all pairs of sequences. And then you run a program that tries to find clusters of sequences that are similar to each other, and so similar to each other that you want to call them a unit in your taxonomic hierarchy. So these units are called OTUs, Operational Taxonomic Units, and it's your way of um, grouping sequences into clusters. And there are probably 500 different computer programs that people use to do this. Um, I don't know which one is the current favorite. Um, by people, but basically what you're trying to do, you can imagine sort of sequences as being in little points in space. 
and the distance that they are from each other is some measure of how similar they are to each other. And you're trying to find little clusters in this space where everything is more similar to each other than they are to anything else. And you run these sort of mathematical algorithms called clustering algorithms to do this with a giant 100 million spot matrix. This is very computationally costly. So most people run um, quick and dirty methods to try and do this. What you get out of that is, you hope, um, a mapping of sequences into these clusters. And now you have a much collapsed set. Instead of 100 million sequences, maybe you have 10,000 clusters that come out of this. And you can now do taxonomic assignment of one representative of each cluster. Instead of 100 million taxonomic assignments, you now have 10,000 taxonomic assignments. Yeah? Is it one representative, or is it a confirmed sequence? Um, most people do one representative of each cluster in the past. Um, if you have sequences that don't overlap very well with each other, you can try and create a consensus to make it bigger. Um, what people usually do is they look for the largest sequence in their cluster, or you can actually run a mathematical algorithm that finds the center of gravity, basically, within the cluster, the thing that is most central. Now, I left out an important part of this, which many people leave out of their papers, too, which is how big your circle is, basically, here. How, how many things you bring into your cluster is basically determined by what cutoff you tell your clustering algorithm to use to put things together into a group. And mostly people use percent identity cutoffs, where they're sliding the sequences against each other, and they say, I'm going to try and put them together into a group if, and then their rule is usually either if they're greater than 99% identical to each other, that's one commonly used rule, or greater than 97% identical to each other. You could do this at any cutoff, but those are the two sort of commonly used. And then, you, you get your OTU list now, and that's what you use for most subsequent steps in analyzing the data. Um, for most ecological analyses, you're going to do this. Even for the taxonomic assignment, like I was saying, you can then feed these into the taxonomy. Even if you wanted to build multiple sequence alignments, rather than trying to build a multiple sequence alignment of 100 million sequences, you could take a representative of each OTU and build your big multiple sequence alignment rather than... Anyway, OTUs are basically um, the tool of choice for most studies now because they allow you to do analyses of orders of magnitude fewer objects than um, if you analyzed all the sequences. There are flaws in this. No clustering algorithms actually work perfectly. So you can occasionally have something that's put into a cluster. Like if two clusters are close to each other, you might have something that's over here occasionally going into that cluster. You might have rarely sequences. You get, for some clustering algorithms, you get long branch attraction. So sequences that are way out in space will get put into the same OTU, even though they're not that similar to each other. So it really depends on the algorithm how well these work, and there's a lot of a lot of hidden analysis behind what people are doing um, that involves clustering into OTUs. And then you use this then to calculate things like how many different species do I have in my sample? And I'll get back to this. The number of different sort of OTUs or species is something called richness. It's an ecological measure. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then you can give information on the relative abundance of different taxa from this, or different OTUs. Another, you know, again, this is just sort of thinking about your goals here. Um, another thing that everybody, of course, wants to do is compare between communities. Now, you can use either of these approaches or additional approaches to compare between communities. So you could run the data through a phylogenetic tree, get taxonomic assignments, and now compare your taxonomic lists between communities. Or you could first do OTU clustering, count the different OTUs, and compare the, which OTUs are found in which different environment between your samples. 
And I'll come back to both of these in a minute. But there's a lot you have to sort of think, do I want to do comparisons between communities? Or am I only really interested in intra-community analyses? And that will affect how you do the analysis. So if you had four samples, and you did ribosome RNA PCR from these four samples, if you didn't think in advance that you wanted to do comparisons between communities, you might take the data from sample one and run all the methods on that, including taxonomy and OTU clustering and phylogenetic analysis and so on. And then you could run it on sample two. And the problem is that it's not always easy to match up the OTU lists that you have between two different runs. It's much better to pool all the data together, run all of your analyses, and then extract back out of that which things go to which samples. So you have to sort of, and you know, some of the computer programs will help you with this, some won't. Um, and um, another metric that um, is actually used on and off, depending on the person doing the study, is you can also, so you can take the data and you can get taxonomy, you can get relative abundance, um, and you can also get what's called PD, and that's the phylogenetic diversity, and this comes up in some of those papers that we were reading, which is basically the total length of all the branches in a tree that go to the sequences from that sample. That's something called phylogenetic diversity. Um, and you know, there are a million other goals that you would want to do, but mostly the people who design the software that a lot of people do use, they think of the simple goals, the simple analyses that you know lots of people are going to want to do, and they fine tune those, and they make those occasionally work well. Um, but they don't spend a lot of time on things that you know one person wants to do. They don't, that doesn't exist in most of these computer programs. Um, so with, with that sort of as the background, I just sort of outlined what is a common workflow for what people actually do when they do one of these analyses. It's basically what I just went through, but um, this is now you sort of divide it up into a bioinformatics flow or a lab and bioinformatics flow. So you have sample collection, PCR, sequencing, um, alignment, if you're going to do alignment, um, you cluster sequences into groups, you me measure the relative abundance of the groups, and you try and assign a taxonomy to each of those groups. And along the way, you can skip over some of these steps. So you could try and assign a taxonomy without the clustering, for example. Or you could add in a phylogenetic diversity metric at the end, and you could do that with your OTUs, or you could do that with all your sequences. And um, when you get your result, it's important to think of all of these steps in the process and everything that can go right or wrong with all of those steps. Because anything in any of these steps could influence your final conclusion. Um, so uh, another way to think of analyzing communities, which I think is actually probably the most useful way to think about this, is um, when you, when you want to measure something in a microbiome or a microbial community or whatever it is, I sort of view this as there are, there are really two main approaches to analyzing a lot of data. A list-based approach where you make a list of the taxa present in your sample and you show, you know, these are my taxa that are present or the relative abundance of them. And you can compare the lists between samples. Um, and there's lots of, you know, that is the number one thing people still do in most micro microbial community studies. But the alternative, which takes a little bit to get used to, is to start to apply directly metrics on within the sample or between samples that are mathematical measures of something about the community diversity. And in general, there are two types of metrics that people use and talk about in all these papers that we will see now. One is called alpha diversity. That is, in essence, within sample diversity. So you look at your sample and you can measure 
the, the diversity of the community within that sample. One way to do this is to count the number of species. That's known as richness. Another way to do this is with a phylogenetic tree and you calculate PD, phylogenetic diversity. So both of those are alpha diversity. They're measuring the diversity within one sample. And they're very different. So you could have two samples that each have 20,000 species, but one of them, the species could all be in the genus Escherichia. And in the other one, you could have representatives of every phylum of bacteria. And so the, most people, if they can do it, prefer to use phylogenetic diversity to, to look at samples because it captures more information than just a list of the OTUs that are present. And then beta diversity is now calculating some metric, basically, to compare the diversity between communities. And as we will see when we get to genomic data or metagenomic data, you can apply these measures to within genome diversity or between genome diversity, and you can apply these measures to within metagenome samples and between metagenome samples. That everybody's basically using the same general concepts. And then what the, the Hughes, the Martini paper and many of the other papers that we will see in here also go into is whether or not we actually take the measure that we've, we've actually measured directly in our data or whether or not we make an estimation of the value based upon some, in essence, model of what the data looks like. Um, so I thought it would also be useful um, because I wasn't sure how many people really um, were familiar with the nitty-gritty details of PCR to just go over this um, quickly, hopefully, but please ask questions. So I assume people get this, um, but PCR is this absolutely just absurdly brilliant invention um, that uh, allows you to exponentially amplify a region of a genome as long as you have primers that correspond to the left and right region of the genome that you want to amplify. And um, we can get into the detail if you want. It probably doesn't matter that much. But what happens is basically you um, make so you go through rounds of um, denaturing the DNA annealing your primers to the DNA that's lowering the temperature so that they bind to the target DNA and then raising the temperature a little bit so a DNA polymerase can copy the DNA where the primer is binding. And you'll see in a minute one of the reasons why I want to go through this. Um, so the first step is you denature the strands so you heat them up and the strands come unwound. This is, you know, should be double-stranded DNA. I'm just drawing it as two lines. And then you lower the temperature, you have this all in one, this is all going on in one test tube. You lower the temperature and your primers now come in and bind. So um, the primer is going to bind here, the primer is going to bind there. DNA has this directionality to it. So you set it up so that the, the primers are complementary in the right direction here. And in the same tube, you've had this primers mixed in. They come in and they bind. You also have a DNA polymerase. You set the temperature to where the DNA polymerase is going to work, and it starts to copy the DNA outside of where the primer bound. And it runs as long as you let it run, basically. Um, if you run it a short period of time, it might only copy a little bit. If you let it run a long period of time, it can keep going for tens of thousands of bases. Mostly, for most PCR, people try and copy a region that's somewhere between 100 and, let's just say, 10,000 bases long. So it doesn't work. It works better on shorter and shorter pieces. And then what you do is you start the cycle again, and you denature the DNA. Now, the original strands separate from these newly replicated pieces. You lower the temperature so that primers bind, and what happens is you get 
primer binding to this original piece, and then the piece that it copied, which is the equivalent to the complementary strand, but incomplete because it started where the primer is, this other primer will bind there and start to copy it. Um, and then this primer will bind here and start to copy that. And basically what you get is um, in the second cycle, you get these short pieces because this now copies only to the end where that first primer annealed. And so what happens is after the first round of PCR, if you started with one copy of the whole genome, so that's at round zero, after one round of PCR, you don't make any extra copies of the whole genome, but you basically make one equivalent copy of these half-length pieces that start at a primer and keep going until you let them stop. So let's call them um, long pieces. And there should be uh, um, genome, long pieces. There's one of the genome, there's zero of the long pieces. After one round, there's one of the genome and one of the long pieces. And then after round two, there's one of the genome. Each genome makes a copy of the long piece. So you add, you had one long piece, you get a new long piece, so now you have two. And each long piece makes one of these short, each, each half piece makes one of these short pieces. So that's your target. And now you do it again. You have one genome, three of these. Each of these makes an additional one of these. You had two, you add one, you've got three. This one, sorry. Um, this, these each make short pieces and these each make short pieces. So you get one plus three, so you get four. That makes sense, what's going on here? And then you do it again. Each of these makes a copy of itself. Each of these makes one of those. So you can now get four plus seven. You get 11. And what ends up happening is you get exponential amplification of the target region. You get linear amplification of these small, these mid-sized pieces. And you get no copying of the whole genome. So whatever is between your two primers, if you run enough cycles, you're going to get billions of copies of that. And the key to all of this is making primers that work well, that go to your target and don't bind anywhere else in the genome of interest. And um, Oh, I've lost some of the image here. But basically what people did, um, even before PCR, as we saw in those papers, is the PACE lab figured out that if you lined up the ribosome RNA genes from different organisms, they were so highly conserved that you could make these primers that they used for the reverse transcriptase sequencing to make copies of any organism's ribosome RNA at any time. And as soon as PCR was described and invented and published in papers, all the ribosome RNA people said, oh my god, um, I can make copies of any ribosome RNA because PCR was originally going after things like the HIV genome. They weren't trying to amplify all viruses. They had a region of the HIV genome they wanted to amplify. They knew the sequence of the flanking regions and they made copies of that. But the ribosome RNA people immediately said, we can use this to make copies of any ribosome RNA without knowing anything about the organism. And, oh yeah, there's the conserved sequences. And so what you do is you line up the sequences, you try and find regions that are 100% identical across all the organisms that you want to go after. That's not always possible, and this is why I mentioned in the previous discussion that people made degenerate primers. But fortunately, ribosome RNA genes are conserved very highly at the DNA level, and you can make primers that don't have a lot of ambiguity in them. And it allows, the PCR works best from environmental samples for ribosome RNA genes. Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is this comes up in a lot of the papers. Some weird things happen in PCR. 
that can ruin, completely ruin your study or make it awkward. So um, the primers are not in fact universal. So people call them universal primers, but some primers bind better to some organisms than to others. And every so often people release a new paper where they say, I've got this new set of primers that's better for this new sequencing technology. Everyone should use these primers because they cover more of the sequence or they cover more diversity. Um, and sometimes what they report is true and sometimes what they report is not true. Um, but there have been many studies that have been you know, quite flawed in their conclusions because the primers did not even amplify the organisms that they thought they were trying to find. Um, so the primer binding is one thing. And then a second thing which is very vexing and there aren't that many ideal solutions to from a laboratory point of view um, is something called chimera creation. So if you have a mixed pool of organisms in a sample, you extract all their DNA and you put them into a test tube and you run ribosomal RNA PCR on that sample. So now your primers will bind to organisms one ribosomal RNA gene, and your primers will bind to organism two's ribosomal RNA gene and to organism three's ribosomal RNA gene. And in the first rounds, they start to make copies, and eventually you get, you know, exponential amplification of whichever genes any of these primers are, you know, as long as both primers are binding to. Unfortunately, another thing that happens is incomplete pieces, let's say one, a few of your pieces don't finish during one of the rounds of extending, um, so it goes about this far. This piece that's now half the length of some organism's ribosome RNA gene can serve as a primer and can go and bind to another organism's ribosome RNA. And it, you will then copy another organism's ribosome RNA next to organism one. And you get these chimeric sequences that are full length, and half of it is from one organism and half of it is from another. And this can be, I mean, there are some analyses that suggest that, you know, in some studies, 90% of the sequences that come out are chimeric. Um, this is a, a big problem for ribosome RNA studies. So one thing that people try to do is play with the PCR conditions to reduce the probability of this happening, and there are lots of protocols where people are trying to do this. And another is they try and analyze the data afterwards. And basically, you in essence build evolutionary trees of different parts of the sequence, or you do glass searches of different parts of the sequence, and you ask, does my left part disagree with my right part? If they do, you throw it away. Um, and there are other ways to, to do this. But um, it will come up in many of the papers and in many of the com computational workflows. There's a whole series of steps called chimera checking. And that's because of PCR. And when you get to random shotgun sequencing metagenomics for environmental samples, much less prone to the creation of chimeras between two different organisms. Um, OK, uh, probably lost the workflow here. But um, if we go back to the workflow, oh, I lost it. Um, so PCR, understanding the PCR is really important for sort of teasing apart when you get results. The sequencing protocols, we've already talked about some of the diversity of sequencing protocols. This is highly sort of interdependent with your PCR protocol. So Illumina sequencing, for example, um, the way it currently works, works best with certain sized fragments of DNA. You don't want your PCR products to be too big or too small, so the PCR is always being sort of fine-tuned to fit the sequencing technology. You get sequences out, and then you want to make an alignment. Um, and I already mentioned this before, the alignment, um, if you want to build a phylogenetic tree of the data, the alignments can be somewhat tricky because what is conserved between organisms outside of those primer regions these highly conserved regions, and this is discussed in the Woese and Pace papers, one of the reasons that ribosome RNA is such a great tool for evolutionary studies is there are highly conserved regions that evolve slowly. Those help you track the evolution of very deep branches in the tree of life. 
And there are intervening regions that evolve incredibly rapidly that allow you to compare closely related organisms to each other. So within one gene, you have data that allows you to look at deep evolutionary time and more recent evolutionary time and everything in between by having different sites that evolve at different rates. Now you can't distinguish you know, members of the same species from each other very well with most ribosome RNA data, but it, it really is a remarkable thing that in 1,500 base pairs of DNA in a genome, you can basically tease apart kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, <laughs> at least at some level. Um, however, to do that correctly, you really want to make sure that you line up those really variable regions correctly with each other with, between different organisms. And because the sequence of those changes pretty rapidly, it's hard to line them up. And what people usually do if they're worried about that is they try and fold their RNA sequence into the known conserved what's called secondary structure. So in two dimensions, you can fold over the ribosomal RNA molecules where they bind to different regions of the ribosome RNA. That's called secondary structure because it's in two dimensions, basically. Um, and you can use that as a guide to lining up the sequences between even when the sequence is not highly conserved. Does that make sense? Um, and you can also use the tertiary structure, that is the three-dimensional structure, that's much, much more rarely used. Um, this turns out to be a bigger problem than it used to be because people used to sequence the full ribosome RNA gene, like the full 16S from an organism of interest or from an environmental sample. And now what people do is they sequence one little region. And frequently, in one little region, you just get one side of these base pairs. And you can't actually tell where you are inside here until you find the other match for these, these base pairs in these what are called stems and loops. And so if you just have 100 base pairs of ribosome RNA, it's almost impossible to do a secondary structure-based model of it. So there's also a lot of discussion in these papers of alignment, at least at some level. Um, OTUs, we already sort of talked about. Um, as I mentioned, there are basically many different clustering algorithms to group them together. And then um, phylogenetic trees, we've talked about a little bit, and I, you know, um, every couple of years there's a new approach that most people end up using. Um, right now it's maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods. I'm sure that will change at some point. Um, so now just to come back to the, these common metrics, because this is what we're getting into in these, um, the, the Hughes and Martini paper and the, um, the other papers is how can we calculate, you know, mathematical measures of the diversity in these different communities. Um, and as I was sort of hinting, you can do alpha diversity in two different ways. Total number of OTUs or species, the phylogenetic diversity of species. And when we get to genetics and genomics, you can do the total number of genes or the phylogenetic diversity of those genes. And this is basically what a lot of these, um, a lot of what you see in ecological studies, the first thing you look at is alpha diversity. So for example, these rarefaction curves, which were in some of these papers and are in many supplemental materials now for new papers because people have moved on beyond alpha diversity for most studies, is different ways of looking at the total number of species or the phylogenetic diversity of species in a sample. And um, you know, you can compare, you can see that depending on the percent identity cutoff you use to determine OTUs will determine you know, how many different things you count in a particular sample. And another thing as we'll get into when we talk about this paper is um, used much more in the past and a little bit less now, but people still use this for, for many samples that have a lot of diversity is if you look at this, these rarefaction curves, they're not hitting an end point. That is, at, I'll back up. These rarefaction curves are basically you take each sequence and you ask, so you sample your data. Let's say you sequence 300 things here, which they sequence like 270 or something. 
If you take sequence number one and you ask, how many OTUs do I find when I look at sequence number one? It should be one. Um, and then you look at sequence number two, and you randomly sample out of your pool of data, and you should repeat this many times, and that's where you get error bars. And you say, with sequence number two, do I get a new OTU or the same OTU as sequence number one? And we just count. So the x-axis is the number of sequences, and the y-axis is the number of OTUs. And if you have a very diverse sample, you should see a high slope. And if you have a not very diverse sample, you should see a low slope and then something coming to an asymptote relatively quickly, because you start to hit all of the OTUs with only a few sequences in your sample. And you know what's painful to many people who study microbial diversity is that in many samples that you look at, you know this is even with 500,000 sequences um, at 3% cutoff to determine OTUs or 6% cutoff for bacteria, which is basically like grouping together things that are in the same family um, or even maybe different orders <laughs> together. Um, even with that, as you got did more and more sequences, you kept seeing more and more OTUs showing up. You know, 15,000 OTUs after 600,000 sequences, and it doesn't appear to be slowing down. Um, there's a lot of diversity in the sequence data that people get out. Yeah. Is the Archaea there sort of showing off just in terms of how well sampled or is this just No no this is an environmental sample, right? Okay. So they're not oh, so the OTU, you. what they're doing here, they're not comparing to any database. It's the first step, which is just clustering sequences and counting. You haven't tried to do taxonomy, you haven't tried to do phylogeny. And um, what, you know, so in the sample that they looked at here for this study, there just wasn't a lot of archaeal diversity. They were hitting somewhat of an asymptote. I mean, it doesn't completely stop. Turns out that much of that is due to chimeras um, rather than real data. Uh, if you do this with a simulated community with the method that they used in this paper where I got this figure from, um, if you have 10 organisms in your community, you still see the curve keep going up as you sample more and more sequences. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot of diversity out there in skin and soil and oceans. Um, and um, so if you're un unable to sample that diversity fully, what people frequently do is they try and estimate the total diversity from some statistical analysis of what you observe. And I sort of mentioned this before, this is, um, as we will get into a little bit, um, so there are many different ways to doing this. Um, there are two that are primary ones that are discussed in the, the Hughes paper, um, the Chow diversity index and the ACE diversity index, and they're basically different models of what you expect a community might look like. And then, um, given those models, they convert the observed data that you get for number of OTUs and number of samples to an estimated diversity. And th there are many different ways to do this. So you can imagine um, if you wanted to estimate the number of men and women on UC Davis campus by um, measuring 10 people. Um, if you went to you know, a woman's soccer game, uh, you're going to get a very different metric than if you take a random sample across campus. If you went to certain classes, they might have a bias, a skewed distribution. So your model of what the community looks like, if you think that it's all random sampling, random movement of men and women on campus, that will affect how you calculate how many men and women are from a small sample. And the same is true for microbes. So um, the Chow diversity index works in one way, the ACE diversity index works in another, and basically, most of these have some sort of hidden model behind them, even if they're not explicit about it, that is a rank abundance curve of what the community looks like. Um, and, and they say, you know, the rank abundance curve should be this type of shape, for example. And if it isn't that shape, the diversity metrics don't work very well. The, the estimates don't work very well for the data. And that's, um, you know, they're... The, the ones discussed in that paper are the ones that are commonly used, but those were the simplest ones, too. There are many other diversity estimators. And you will see, I mean, I've 
absurd things that come from these di different diversity estimators. So every couple of years, there's a new way to estimate the total number of species on the planet, for example. And a few years ago, there was a paper that estimated it to be like, you know, 15 million, and then someone else had a paper estimating it was 200,000, and then someone else had a paper estimating it was 100 million, and that's for all organisms. And the one, the methods that work well for plants and animals don't work well for microbes, and the methods that work well for microbes don't work well for plants and animals, and they're all basically because of the model that they have behind them. Um, one of the papers est estimated that there were two species of archaea in the oceans, even though thousands had been actually observed. So their model reduced, the, they went from a certain number of observed and actually estimated that there were fewer than had been observed, which is very strange. Um, I don't know what the shape of their distribution curve was supposed to be like. Um, and then basically what people, what you will see in most, you know, sequence-based microbial diversity studies is some attempt to compare samples to each other with beta diversity metrics. And then to look at those beta diversity metrics and ask how well they correlate with some interesting functional or historical or environmental piece of information. And so basically you can imagine um, the lists that you can make or the richness metrics that you would make for a community or the phylogenetic diversity metrics that you can make within a community, any of those can be mathematically compared between communities and you can get a beta diversity calculation. So you can make a list of OTUs and calculate the shared presence and absence of OTUs between communities and that's one way of calculating beta diversity. What is commonly used in the microbial studies is in one of these papers which is UNIFRAC, um, which is um, a pretty cool approach that has been used in plant and animal studies for many years but um, was not used much in microbial studies until they came out with this UNIFRAC program. So if you have two communities um, of organisms and you get ribosome RNA data from the two of them, you pool them all together and you group those into OTUs and then you take a representative of each OTU and you build an evolutionary tree of it What um, Catherine Lozapone and Rob Knight um, developed was this UNIFRAC method, which is basically you take now your tree of OTUs and you annotate it saying whether or not that OTU, let's say OT1, was present in environment O or present in environment X. And some of them will be present in both. Some of them will be present in one and not the other. And if this was the only data that you looked at, none could be absent in both, but frequently you have another sample here and <coughs> another sample here, so some of them might be absent from both. And the way you calculate a distance between the communities is you measure the shared evolutionary branches between the two communities, and you calculate how much they differ, basically. So here is an evolutionary branch that they share. So you go back to the, the root of that branch. Here, that part of the branch only counts for community X, because that OTU is only in community X. Then this branch is shared again. And you keep going your way through here. This branch only counts for community O. And now you sum up the length of these branches that are shared or the length of the branches that are unique. And unifract is basically the fraction, the unique fraction that corresponds to a particular um, community. And they have a way of calculating a distance between communities by their overlap in the, what they share between the communities. And that is a better, well, a alternative approach to comparing the list of OTUs, because you could also take this list and just calculate percent shared OTUs. And many people do that too. But this phylogeny-driven method takes into account if two OTUs are really closely related and they're shared between a community that's very different than if two OTUs are very distant 
and shared between a community. Since those two seem to be full, what's the accountability or reconciliation? Um, the reconciliation of the list-based approach versus the tree approach, or? Well, just the fact that you'll see the similar and similar tree in the traits or metrics or um, characteristics between Well, I mean, between communities? Yeah. Uh, well, so what, what, here, I'll show you. Um, so what people try and do then is they take a data set where there are 20 communities that they're sampling or 50 oh, communities that you're sampling, and you calculate distances between all of them. You now group your samples by how similar they are on average to other samples. That's what this plot shows, basically. And then you overlay onto that information about those samples. So in this case, they did a study of um, healthy and diseased people, healthy versus people with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. They went, did ribosome RNA PCR, OTU clustering, um, phylogenetic trees, and then this unifrac distance. And then they grouped the samples into space by how similar they were in unifrac distance to other samples. And it turns out that all the Crohn's disease samples grouped together to the exclusion of the ulcerative colitis and healthy samples. And the ulcerative colitis and healthy samples have a little bit of overlap between them, but on average, most of the ulcerative, ulcerative colitis samples have, are more similar to other ulcerative colitis samples than they are to healthy samples. So this is now what people are doing for most ribosome RNA and metagenomic studies is walking your way through the data, converting the data into distances of some metric, and then trying to overlay environmental information onto those distances. Yeah. So, so is this the PCA or PCOA plots that are based on sort of a distance matrix? Can you sort of think of this as like having almost a tree underlying that structure? Not necessarily phylogenetic, but like... Um, so... Uh, PCA and PCOA methods yeah. basically run a complicated linear algebra calculation of where to, how to draw out objects in this space. There's a formula that is there then at the end of doing this, that it, it is searching for that formula basically. Um, but you, you can't easily convert that into a tree-based concept. Um, this guy named Eric Matson, who's now at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Washington, developed a tree-based PCA method that is in our PhiloCIP program. That's why we collaborated with him, this tool that came from our lab, which is a called Edge PCA. And it actually has a phylogenetic model behind the, the splashing of things into PCA space. I the math in page zero is beyond me. Um, so uh, I couldn't explain to you how he did this, but yeah. he's very smart and I trust him. It's just because um, you said that they group together to the exclusion of Crohn's disease, which you can see here, but I, I, is there like a, I don't know, a metric that you, because it's sort of a qualitative. Oh, so, the, 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 so <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, there are no, I mean, there are papers where people have then said, I'm going to take this data and try and, rather than drawing a circle around things, actually calculate statistically how separate objects are. There are algorithms to do that. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't be able to explain them to you. Um, but what, uh, what people do is actually they go even further. So, oh, I, I didn't have the last slide, so I'm just going to go back. They go even further, which is, oh, I wrote it here, but I didn't add the slide. You can take this data now, and it's not um, perfect back calculation, but you can, in essence, back calculate the math such that you can figure out which organisms are causing the Crohn's disease samples to group together most in your data. Uh, sort of like the, the idea before where you talked about the sequence alignment to become the center of gravity. Yeah. So, but these are much more complicated because. Yeah. You have this unifrac distance 
And then you take those distances and you run PCA on those distances, which has this weird linear algebra transformation. And then objects that are close together in your PCA space, um, you're basically trying to traverse your way all the way back to this figure um, and the distance matrices and figure out which parts of the tree are driving these patterns. And that's what this edge PCA method, he, he, he designed it so that going backwards was easier in the math. And if you just run normal PCA math, and you know, you're basically most people connected together programs that were designed for different purposes. And there was no, I mean, frequently you didn't even have a way of figuring out what the PCA even did. Um, so that was really hard until his method. And you can do the same with genes now. So people are basically doing these clusterings and then saying, which genes or taxa drive the clustering? Drive the clustering. That doesn't say which is causing what. Yeah. It just means which are the most similar among the objects that cluster together. Um, so uh, in essence, this is with, with, with a few branches that you'd have to insert for doing functional analysis with genomic data or metagenomic data. These, the, the, the workflow that I've laid out here is a, in essence what people use for many types of comparisons when they're comparing to organisms to each other or to communities to each other with any type of data. Um, and sequence data is nice in a sense because you can develop statistical sampling methods to go back through the data. It's much harder to do that with certain types of, you know, morphological data, for example. Or, yeah. Is there a way to see if this pattern is the disease causing the microbes or the microbes causing the disease? So if you just did this, um, where they took ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, and healthy, and you clustered them in space, and you showed that the microbes were different in those different states. There is no way. It is purely a correlation. Um, it could be that when you get, so I'll, you could get Crohn's disease. Let's say it's caused by overactive inflammation system in your immune system. And that could then change your microbial community. And everybody with Crohn's disease might on average have the same change in their immune system that leads to a change in their community. Or you could be colonized by the wrong microbes when you're, you know, little, <laughs> and those microbes could drive the, you know, phenotypic change that leads to certain patterns of inflammatory bowel disease. So um, either one is possible. The only way to use this that I've seen papers claiming, I have not ground truth these, um, I have seen people claiming that if you do time series um, with multiple data types, that you can at least see which trait is the most likely to have a causative effect on the phenotype because it is the first one to, if you had like taxa here and then genes here and um, appearance of microbes here, and you had 10 other things that you observed about the people, let's say their diet, and, and, and if you ran this algorithm, and at the end, all 10 of those traits that you observed showed this pattern. But if you had a time series, you could see at, at time point one, is it only the diet that is correlated to Crohn, what, what people are going to get Crohn's disease. And so I have seen these time series papers where they argue that by looking at the which ones change earliest, you can get closer to a causative connection, but it's still not causative. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, um, so mostly for these, what people are going to do here is the same as with any other biological experiment, which is that if you're not going to manipulate the system, if you're just going to do a retrospective study of things that happened, and you're not controlling for other variables, you can't tell cause and effect. So um, that's why there are mouse models and human clinical trials. <laughs>
Like, what kind of data do you put in the data? Do you see it like this? Like, do you just put in the species? Or like so you literally put in um, a table that is sample one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and the unit, whatever your beta diversity calculation is. So it's basically a big distance matrix um, with samples. And then what the, the PCA is basically, I mean, the math is complicated, but it's basically a clustering algorithm that is grouping your objects to try and pull together all the different samples that are most similar to each other into, does that make sense? So if you have a big distance matrix, let's make it a simple one with four things. Here's A, B, C, D. So four samples. And the distance between A and B is, um, you know, five arbitrary units. And let's make it symmetrical. So we're just going to show distance between A and C is 25. The distance between A and D is 20. The distance between B and C is 18. The distance between B and D is 35. And the distance between C and D is 10. And what all of these methods are going to try and do, and PCA is just sort of one version of that, is to draw a reduced dimensionality image, in this case, two-dimensional image, where the spots are pulled together, the samples are pulled together in that two-dimensional space based upon the distances in this distance matrix. And the problem is that this is, it's never, um, for, for analyses like this, there's never any way to perfectly represent the, all the data. <coughs> so there are different algorithms for trying to, you know, so like a clustering algorithm, a simple one would just go through, and I sort of drew this on the board before, and say, well, A and B are close, so I'm going to put A and B together on this little tree diagram. And C and D are close, so I'm going to put C and D together. They're a little bit further apart than A and B are, so I'm going to draw a little bit longer connection between them. And then, uh, I don't really know how to connect A and B and C and D, because B to D is 35, and C, B to C is 18, and I can't draw the lengths of these branches in any way to connect them perfectly. And PCA analysis is just an, another way to do this, where you're transforming the distances um, into what are called principal components. Um, and I couldn't explain the math to you. I mean, I knew it 20 years ago, probably, but um, I couldn't explain it to you. You basically mm -hmm. have a program that is searching for the, the best way to, to splay out samples on dimension one and dimension two. Um, and a lot of people prefer principal component analysis these days for large data sets. We still use clustering algorithms for many of the things we do in our lab. Um, I, I, I can understand them better in my head. Um, well, can you explain like what these like principal like PC one and PC two would represent on this graph like, in general? Like, so they don't. The problem with principal component analysis is they represent a mathematical formula that the computer program came up with to do this, and they don't represent anything in biology. There is no. They're basically like the distance. Um, times 11 divided by four times the distance to W minus seven. I mean, it's a, a complicated algebraic formula that comes out of a, a method I don't understand. So I'm going to be, you know, just jumping into deep water. I don't know if anybody else, you, I don't know if Holly knows how it works better than I do. Um, but uh, so the problem that I've always had with this is there's no instinctive understanding of what the different axes are because of this mathematical transformation. It doesn't correspond to anything in directly in biology. And why this um, uh, Eric Matson was starting to work with other methods to do principal component analysis, he wanted to show it on an evolutionary tree. How, where, you know, because he got what an he, it, he it made sense to him what an evolutionary tree of the sequences was. I, I couldn't tell you what this means.
other than that it's a way of seeing if samples are more similar to each other than they are to anything else. Is that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there's principal coordinate analysis, which is a derivative of principal component analysis, and I don't have any idea what that does. Can you do it? Yeah. On a practical medical basis, are those treated as ones confined to the colon and then systemic? So are those treated as autoimmune diseases, or do they sometimes introduce even on the new flora, or what do they do? You mean how do they? How did people now respond to this data? On um, so uh, does it affect treatment? Yes, so there are new studies of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis that have shown that there are different types of microbial communities within Crohn's and different types of microbial communities within um, other types of, in every type of autoimmune inflammatory disease. So the diversity within something that was previously all classified as Crohn's is much more helpful in thinking about treatment. And I have seen people attempting now to see if the people with those different clusters of communities respond differently to therapeutics, for example. I don't know. I mean, I don't work on these diseases, so I don't know what people are doing now, but... I just wonder if there's a practical application. There are absolutely... I mean, this... Um, what is happening in microbial diversity studies is pretty much this right now, where people are comparing people with people or birds or soil samples with these types of analyses, they're detecting clusters, and then they say, is there, um, uh, do the phenotypes map onto these clusters? And if they do, the first thing that this is used for is diagnostics. So you could use this to say, I have someone with um, a weird phenotype, we can't tell if they're Crohn's or not. Um, or we're trying to track them developing a particular phenotype, and they might use this as a diagnostic feature. Whether or not these patterns are then useful as a treatment-based diagnostic, as opposed to just, you know, assisting the, you know, diagnostic is still to be determined. That is, can you use this to tell you what to do? Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't work on those things. I mean, there are Probably there's a new paper today, I think, on this, actually. I just, I mean, there's a lot of work on this. There are like 10 NIH programs. <laughs> I just don't track it, so I don't know. All right. That's it.